This video is powered by Woodware's Woodbook Y14, a lightweight and sleek notebook based on AMD's Ryzen 7 CPU with Radeon graphics. Perfect for productivity and lightweight gaming. For more info, click the link in the description below. Hey everyone, now once again, and yep, we have another mid-range chipset budget board from ASUS. This time, it's based on the B860 chipset from Intel, the ROG Strix B860G Gaming Wi-Fi. And as far as B860 boards go, this is one of the most expensive B860 boards you can buy locally. So what price are we talking about here? Well, I have no idea what the US dollar pricing is, as I can neither find it on Amazon or Newegg. However, Locally, Woodware has it for 5970 That being said, that's a high price for a B860 board and oddly enough, it's the ASUS Prime Z890M Plus that makes the B860G a hard sell at face value of course. The Z chipset simply allows more tuning and overclocking, whereas the B860 does not. At 5998 the Prime board is simply too attractive an alternative to the B860G to not be considered. If for some reason, however, you're not interested in any form of overclocking, and let's face it, the current 200 series of CPUs don't allow much of this outside of the e-course, then the B860G has a ton of features that can, in the right context, make for a compelling purchase. As a board, I think it looks incredible. The size and color scheme look great. The ROGI's aesthetic is perfect and just purely based on the looks alone, the B860G is one of the best available. From all angles and even on the underside of the board, it looks the part. This is one very attractive motherboard. The power solution, while modest by today's standards, is pretty good, using 80 m power stages in a 14 plus 1 plus 2 plus 1 configuration. As usual, more than enough for any CPU on this platform. Connectivity-wise, it ticks all the boxes for today's modern platforms. So, you have four M.2 sockets, one is Gen 5 and the others are Gen 4. The Gen 5 M.2 socket has the best heatsink, with a simple yet elegant solution for installation. The heatsink itself is quite beefy with plenty of surface area and should be able to keep current Gen 5 drives operating at peak performance or close to it. The other heatsink on the other hand for the remaining drives is rather thin and if you populate all sockets, I think things may get a little bit toasty, especially with the high-end GPU installed dumping some heat onto the heatsink. As for the board headers, we have a single USB 2.0 header, 5 4-pin PWM fan headers, 3 ARGB headers, a single USB 3.0 header, and one 10 gigabit Type-C header for your front panel. Naturally, there's a single Gen 5 PCIe 16-lane slot. Turning to the rear I.O., we have DisplayPort, HDMI out, 4 USB 2.0 ports, 3 USB 5G ports, Thunderbolt 4, a single USB 10G port, a 20G Type-C port, clear CMOS and BIOS flashback buttons. We also have Wi-Fi 7 and Bluetooth 5.4 connectors and of course two mini jacks and SPDIF out for audio. Speaking of audio, this Supreme FX solution is based on the ALC 1220p codec, a Savitec op-amp, audio-grade capacitors, all of which are enhanced by Adobe Atmos license. So pretty much standard stuff for high-end boards these days. Okay, so this is the part that is probably most important if you are considering a BA60 board, and in particular this one, as it does attempt to mitigate some of the limits Intel has imposed on the chipset. Yes, you're unlikely to pay a Case Q CPU with the B-Series motherboard, but it does serve to highlight some of the constraints of the chipset itself. For one, it's not just the CPU ratio that you can increase with the B860. This limit extends to the CPU cache ratio, the NGU and die-to-die -die ratio as well. While you can input these, they will not apply. As such, while the motherboard does support DDR5 speeds officially up to DDR5-9066, not only could I not get to such a speed to post, but even when I did get DDR5-8600 to post, the performance was limited. And why is that? Well, in particular for DRAM read performance, or write performance rather, you need to increase the NGU ratio, and since you can't, it remains the bottleneck for memory write performance. As a workaround, select XMP tweaked 
or set it manually to asynchronous SOC clock of 125 megahertz. This will keep all the other clock domains running normally for the most part, of course, but allow you to increase the available bandwidth for the memory write interface. As such, you will then be able to break the 108 gigabytes per second write bandwidth limit and get closer to about 126 gigabytes a second instead, at least when using DDR5, 8400 and beyond. The downside of this is slightly increased idle power draw and an increase in the CPU input voltage. This does not mean the CPU is being fed 1.6 volts as you can see in the screenshot right now. It's just the CPU input voltage. You will also need to select the appropriate ratio for your memory, since increasing the SOC clock also increases the memory clock. Since I was using Kingston's Renegade Fury DDR5-8400 memory, closest to the speed was DDR5-8417 which worked out just fine. Moreover, keep in mind that you can't set voltage frequency offsets on this motherboard as well, meaning some CPU performance is lost when compared to the Z-series boards where you can use the thermal allowance to increase the opportunities for the CPU to reach its peak frequencies. Keep in mind as well that some benchmarks incur a performance penalty when overclocking this way, but they are fewer than the ones that actually gain from this. With that out the way, let's get to the benchmarks. Testing was done on the Intel Core Ultra 285K, cooled by the ROG Ryujin 3 360A RGB Extreme, Kingston's Renegade Fury DDR5-8400 CU DIMM kit, the ROG Strix GeForce RTX 4080, all of which is powered by the XPG Fusion 1600W ATX 3.0 PSU. First up, we have IDA64, where the overclocking nets the system almost 40 gigabytes per second more in bandwidth, while reducing the memory latency by 29%. The gains would be much less if it were not for the SOC overclocking. Next is V-Ray and Cinebench R23. Cinebench is one of the tests that is actually compromised by this sort of overclocking, as the score is reduced by a total of 13%. Cinebench 2024, on the other hand, sees no change to the single core result, but does gain 3% in the multi-core test. Geekbench 6 sees an increase in performance of 13% from the overclock, while the Benchmade 7 zip benchmark gains just 11%. SuperPi 32M is just 2.7% quicker, while the 3D Mark CPU profile test, much like the Cinebench R23, shows a decrease in performance because of the overclock. When we get to the gaming benchmarks, the performance is improved all around, with the Hitman World of Assassination gaining about 10% in both the 1% lows and average frame rate. Forza Horizon 5 shows a 20% improvement in the 1% lows, but a modest 6% in the average frame rate. Then last, obviously but not least, we have Cyberpunk on the other hand, which shows a 25% gain in the 1% lows and a 10% in the average frame rates. Not bad at all, I must say. So overall, I would say the overclocking and tuning is worth it despite the few tests that show negative scaling. As is, I think the ROG team has basically done the most that it can with the chipset and that has improved the prospects for gamers but also increased the price to the point where there are viable Z890 alternatives from the ASUS Prime series. If you're not remotely interested in overclocking but want a feature packed and great looking board, the B860G gaming Wi-Fi is worth serious consideration. Either way, would you rather buy this or an entry-level Z890 board like the Prime series that I spoke about? Let me know in the comments below and until the next time, please take great care of yourself and peace!